Well, wake up, sleepyhead. It's Russ Barkley back again for your Saturday research review. Welcome to a fine Saturday morning here at the end of September in lovely Richmond, Virginia. We have five articles I want to talk with you about today. But before I get to them, as always, let's take a look at some really terrible dad jokes. These come from the website redbubble.com. And here they are. What building has the most stories? A library. Yeah, a library. Think about it. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. This is not so good, but uh, you'll get it. So, why are ghosts such bad liars? Because you can see right through them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, and finally, where do dogs hate shopping? A flea market. Makes perfect sense to me. Don't know about you. Okay, let's have a look at our research for this week. Now, this week, I've chosen a couple of papers that were published all under the uh, authorship of people with the Center for Disease Control. And the reason I put them together is that they all suffer from the same flaws, which I'll talk about in a moment. And yet, another reason I'm bringing them up is that when studies like this appear, they're often very quickly picked up by the trade media here in the U.S., in part because the CDC is our government agency. It's supposed to be helping us with public health. More recently, in the last few decades, it's gotten into the area of mental health and psychiatric disorders. But it's given a certain cash or credibility by virtue of being our government's agency, primarily for dealing with infectious disease, but now broadening to deal more with other public health issues. Uh, and so I understand that, except that sometimes the CDC gets it wrong. And in the area of ADHD, I have found that they often do so with their papers. And so I've chosen three of the articles that they published in the last couple of months to talk about them briefly, share the results with you, and tell you why you need to be skeptical of these particular results. Uh, and as you'll see, I also have a bone to pick with the CDC around ADHD because I think at times they misstate the nature of our literature, as when four years ago they held a press conference claiming that preschool or young ADHD children should always be given behavioral parent training first before ever considering using stimulant medication with them. And in that, they also went on to say that behavioral parent training was equally as effective as medication and that parent training produces no side effects. And they are wrong on all counts. And I wrote several editorials in various journals uh, questioning, if not contradicting, that those particular statements at that press conference. So uh, let's have a look at this first study. This is on the prevalence of ADHD among U.S. children and adolescents as of 2022. It's based on a very large survey that is done by the Center for Disease Control called the National Survey of Children's Health. And it involves children three to 17 years of age. And there are over 45,000 children monitored in this particular survey. So you would think, hey, sounds good. Big sample done by a government agency ought to be done right. Uh, let's, let's have a look at what they found, and then I'll tell you what's wrong. They're claiming in their results that one in nine U.S. children for a prevalence rate of 11.4% have, um, have ADHD or were diagnosed as ADHD, and 10.5% have it currently. And then they go on to talk about some co-occurring disorders. Approximately half of the children uh, received medication, the other half didn't. About 44% got some form of behavioral treatment, uh, others did not, uh, and then nearly a third of them did not receive any ADHD-specific treatment. So, so very interesting findings, and that figure, 11% of American children have ADHD. That's pretty high, uh, higher than most estimates, by the way. And why would that be the case? Because if you look closely at the study's methodology. I'm scrolling down here to what was used to determine if a child has ADHD. This is all it was. They asked the parents one question. Has a doctor or any other healthcare provider ever told you that your child 
had ADD or ADHD. That's it. No effort to confirm the parent report, to follow up with the professional to see how they diagnose. Did they diagnose that child? So there's a lot wrong with this. And just using one question to determine presence of a clinical disorder is a big one. Because such a question, as you can imagine, would grossly overestimate the true prevalence of this disorder in the population. And I think that's what's happening here uh, as well. So uh, while it's nice to see that figure and it did get picked up this year by our media uh, and reported as if this was the voice of God, uh, the fact is that there's a lot wrong with this study and it starts with that issue. You can't just corroborate the presence of ADHD in anybody based on a single question. My God, the, the family's nurse could have said something. It could have been a school nurse. It could have been uh, someone else in the healthcare system, like a, a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Uh, it certainly didn't have to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist or someone well-trained, like a behavioral pediatrician, in diagnosis of ADHD. So um, there's that study. By the way, anytime the media quotes the CDC about ADHD, take it with a grain of salt. It's probably overestimating prevalence and other factors. Now, let's go on and take a look at a second paper that they published uh, just a few months ago. This one is in the journal Prevention Science, and it is a systematic review of all of the literature with regard to parental depression, use of antidepressants, antisocial personality, stress and anxiety in the parents as risk factors for ADHD in the children. And they go on to talk about having reviewed all this literature, 58 articles they found were included in their meta-analysis. Well, of course, guess what? Virtually all of those were found to varying extents to predict ADHD in children. So parental depression, parent stress, and so on. Now, what did they conclude from this? that these family parent characteristics were contributing to the child's risk for ADHD. In other words, they imply causation, even though we know this is just correlational. And we also know that one thing they did not control for at all or even examine in this paper was parental ADHD, which, by the way, is linked to every other variable they found that would predict child ADHD. So the things they're looking at may not be directly causing anything. They are all known to be correlates of adult ADHD, suggesting, as would certainly make sense, given the genetics of ADHD, that the parents had ADHD too. And it's parental ADHD that is driving the risk of ADHD in the offspring. The rest of this is just a red herring, as we say. They're just markers for the parent's own psychopathology and genetic risk that is then passed on to the child. So that's not to say that these factors might not make some things worse. We certainly know that maternal depression, stress, and so on can contribute to oppositional behavior in children. There is a parent contribution to that, a family contribution. But this study cannot draw causal conclusions. It can't infer what it wants to. And that is, as it says in the conclusion, these findings raise the possibility that prevention strategies that promote parental mental health could address the risk of ADHD in offspring. I don't think so, but we'll see. The final study, again, from the CDC, also published in Prevention Science, again published earlier this year, is another review, a meta-analysis. This is looking at family environment risk factors. So they're gonna be looking at parenting. They're not looking like the last study at parent psychiatric disorders. They're looking at parenting factors. And they looked at a whole host of them in this review of the literature. They found a total of 59 studies that they then put into their meta-analysis. And what they found was that all of the factors they looked at were related to risk of ADHD in the child. 
with the exception of maternal warmth and sensitivity. What were the factors that they were looking at? Well, besides that one, they were looking at the parenting interaction quality. Was it intrusive and reactive? Was it negative and harsh? They were also looking at general maltreatment and physical abuse. They were looking at parental relationship status, such as divorce, single parenting. They also looked at child media exposure and whether or not the parents had been incarcerated. And as I said, they found that all of those elevated the risk of ADHD in the children. So think about it. What's wrong with this study? Exactly what was wrong in the last study. The things that they're identifying as risk factors are already known to be associated with parental ADHD, which was not studied at all in this paper, and yet could easily have explained most of these results, including the risk for ADHD in the child. Once again, I'm not saying that some of these factors might not have some small effect on risk. They might. But until you have a genetically informed design that takes into account that the parent likely has the same disorder as the child, especially given the high genetic uh, risk, uh, the high genetic loading for ADHD, you can't draw causal inferences about family environment and parenting strategies contributing to the risk for ADHD, which is what they wanted to do here. So shame on the CDC for these three studies, very large, that could easily have been and probably were picked up by some media for not going the extra mile to control for parental ADHD. And in the first study on prevalence, relying on just one question to determine if somebody had ADHD. Okay, enough beating up on the CDC. Let's go on to paper number four here. This is on the effects of ADHD and its treatment on glycemic management in patients with type 1 diabetes. It's also a meta-analysis, and it concludes that if you have type 1 diabetes and you have ADHD, your glycemic management is going to be more variable. It's not going to be ideal. There are probably going to be some problems with you or cooperating and complying with treatment. So the authors conclude that where ADHD overlaps with type 1 diabetes, clinicians need to screen for that ADHD, but especially need to management because identifying and managing the ADHD symptoms, as they point out, could improve management of the various aspects of glycemic factors in type 1 diabetes. So, okay, very interesting paper there on uh, that we've seen with other health problems that link up with ADHD. If you don't manage the ADHD, you're going to have trouble managing the medical or health-related problems that you're trying to deal with. Because ADHD being a disorder of self-regulation is going to interfere with the self-regulation needed to follow through on proper care, management, and medical advice. Lastly, I want to talk about a recent study that came out, uh, this one in Sweden, and it looks at the factors related to identifying and supporting females with ADHD. It involves a large population sample, over 85,000 individuals with ADHD in Sweden, and it obviously separates them into males and females and looks at when were they diagnosed and how long did it take to get a diagnosis and what about treatment? How did that go? And it finds that overall females with ADHD showed higher rates of psychiatric comorbidity, pharmacological management, and healthcare utilization than did males with ADHD or than did the female control group. But just as important, they found that females were four to five years older before they got diagnosed than were the males, suggesting that the Swedish healthcare system and maybe other healthcare systems in other countries might be slower to identify and then manage ADHD in females. So a very interesting study there that suggests that 
there is differences in identification and care of females with ADHD than in males. All right, that's our five studies for this weekend. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the dad jokes. Got a few laughs there this morning. And uh, as always, join me again next weekend for another research review. Uh, and traditionally, as I usually say, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing. Recommend our channel to others you think might have a need for it. And as always, be well. Thanks, everybody, and good day.